This is the Unique Scotland podcast with exclusive scottishvisits.co.uk. Hello, this is John Harbour and welcome to Unique Scotland, the go-to podcast on all things Scottish. And I'm delighted to have you with me on this first part of my tour of the Scottish borders. I believe that this area does not get the recognition it deserves and most tourists head for the Northern Highlands and the Islands of Skye. Well, if you get the opportunity whilst visiting Scotland, then the borders region is one you should try to visit. Presently, I'm taking a break from my own northern meanderings to bring you a taste of what this lovely area has to offer. Today, I'm broadcasting this from my study in Aberlady in East Lothian, which is a beautiful part of Scotland, adjacent to the wonderful sandy beaches of the North Sea coast. With nature reserves, golf courses and some extraordinary historical sites, this area is worthy of a podcast on its own. So let me just write that down on my list of things to do. Fine, right. Well, it's the end of July and sadly the wet weather has continued, but there have been occasional days of sunshine, with temperatures actually soaring to 21 degrees centigrade. Please don't laugh. Well, in this podcast, we're going to travel from Edinburgh down to the borders, passing through some medieval villages en route. We'll be travelling on roads built by the Romans in the second century, and we'll be looking at some scintillating castles and other fascinating buildings on our way. You'll hear of Thomas the Rhymer a 13th century clairvoyant whose prophecies were uncannily accurate. And who was the warrior lady who, during the Battle of Ancrum, had her legs chopped off, but she continued to fight? We'll also look into the ruined border abbeys at Dryborough and Kelso to hear of the battles that ravaged those holy places, whether it was English armies invading Scotland or Scottish armies invading England. The resultant carnage was the same. This and so much more to come. So I think it's time to get the tour of the borders underway and... As always, it's great to share Scotland with you. Perhaps this podcast will whet your appetite to come and visit this fine country for yourselves. And if, for whatever reason, you can't come to Scotland in person, then let me bring Scotland to you. To see some great photos of the border abbeys and castles, then have a look at my website, exclusivescottishvisits.co.uk, my Facebook page or Instagram. And if you listen through my website, then please don't forget to subscribe to ensure that you get notification of future episodes. And if you're interested, I'll also put out some short videos of the Scottish borders on my exclusive Scottish Visits YouTube channel. Well, wherever you are in the world, I would now like you to relax and join me on this tour to the picturesque and extraordinary borders of Scotland. This might seem crazy, but every time I look at the moon, the Scottish borders come to mind. Now I know some of you will be thinking, oh oh, John has really lost it this time, but bear with me. When most people look at the moon, they will surely remember that magnificent feat by the Apollo 11 astronauts who, in 1969, made history by being the first crewed mission to land on the moon. And the first man to set foot on the surface of the moon was, yes, Neil Armstrong. Well, here's the connection. Neil Armstrong's ancestors were from the Scottish borders, from a wee village called Langholm. And I was reminded of this when I listened to the BBC News last month. You know how you're half listening to something and then an item makes you stop and turn the radio up a wee bit to get more information on the relevant bulletin? Well, what I heard was that the European Lunar Symposium was going to take place in Dumfries, and that's in the southwest of Scotland. And this was the first time it had been staged in Scotland. I mean, my surprise came to the fact that there are a large number of prestigious places that such an august body could hold such a prominent symposium. It was only when Professor Mahesh Anand, who chairs the group, made a connection with Neil Armstrong's ancestral home, Langholm, being only 10 miles from Dumfries, that I realised the significance of this town's choice. And the fact that Neil Armstrong visited Langholm in 1972, only three years after his lunar walk, made the connection more appropriate. 
Well, I tracked down a report dated March 2022 by Giancarlo Rinaldi, the BBC's South of Scotland reporter on BBC Scotland News website, who stated, It's a moment they still talk about in Langholm 50 years after the event. Nobody who was there will ever forget the day the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, visited his Scottish home. The small South of Scotland town, the traditional seat of Clan Armstrong, welcomed him as one of its own on a bright, chilly March day in 1972. And Armstrong was quoted as saying, The most difficult place to be recognised is in one's own hometown, and I consider this now my hometown. As usual, I'm digressing a bit, but before we get on the road for our tour of the borders, I must mention that the Armstrongs have been an extremely prominent clan in the border regions with history dating back to the 11th century. And there were many other competing clans as well, such as the Elliots, Carruthers, Pringle, Scott. And how could I forget Nixon, the namesake of a future president of America? I'll come back to the border clans later, but in the meantime, let me get back to the start of our tour, which begins in Edinburgh. Before we actually depart the city, it's probably a good idea to tell you exactly where the Scottish borders are. And it's more than just the border region between Scotland and England. The borders actually lie within the area called the Southern Uplands, or the Rolling Hills, in the south of Scotland. And they form the most southern part of Scotland's three major geographical areas, with the central lowlands and the highlands being the other two. Now, if you stand at the top of Arthur's Seat, or even Edinburgh Castle, and look south, you will see a range of hills called the Moorfoots, about 12 miles away. And these denote a geological fault line called the Southern Uplands Fault, which runs all the way across Scotland from Ayrshire in the west to Dunbar in the east. And this is where the Southern Uplands begin and the end at the border with England. I suppose the uplands describe a varying range of hills and mountains, although unlike the West Coast Highlands, there are no Munros in this area. And of course, from previous podcasts, you will recall that a Munro is a mountain over 3,000 feet. The southern uplands is sparsely populated and is a huge rural and agricultural area. And the lasting impression of the scenery as you drive down there is one of green rolling hills with numerous cattle and sheep grazing in sublime peace. So that is where we're heading and from the centre of the city we'll drive south and pick up the A7 road out towards the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, one of the main hospitals in the city. Near this point you'll see a sign for Craig Miller Castle, which, if you have time, is worth a visit. I took my grandchildren there a few weeks ago and they love to climb to the top with wonderful views over Edinburgh. It's a ruined 14th century Tower House castle with a surrounding wall built by the powerful Preston family. Its claim to fame is that Mary Queen of Scots met with her lords to discuss her husband, Lord Darnley, just before he was murdered at the Kirk of Fields. Was she involved in that murder? Well, this question is still testing historians today, so I won't even try to address it here. I also have to mention an Outlander connection for fans of the show. Craig Miller Castle was used as the location for Ardsmuir Prison, where Jamie was incarcerated. Well, as we continue down the A7, you'll pass through a village called Little France, and it's believed that this name has stuck since the retinue or staff who worked for Mary, Queen of Scots, lived in this area in the 16th century, when Mary resided in Craigmiller Castle. Of course, Mary spent most of her adolescent youth in France, married the heir to the throne, then became Queen Consort, so that when her husband died so suddenly after only a year, Mary returned to Scotland with a large French staff who settled near Craig Miller. From the A7, you will come to the city bypass, or circular road, leading around the city and head east for a couple of miles before taking the junction with the A68 heading south. As you start your drive down this road, you already begin to feel the strictures of the city falling behind and wide green fields opening up before you. On the right-hand side, and almost out of sight, you'll see a sizeable settlement, which is Dalkeith, a town with a population of around 12,000 people. It radiates from a 12th century castle, now the Dalkeith Palace, and is the main administrative centre for Midlothian County. I know this town quite well, because it's where we'd come to do our main shopping from my small mining village of Gore Bridge, where I was brought up. The next small town that you will come to is Path Head, and just before you enter, you will cross the Lothian Bridge, which was one of Thomas Telford's creations. It's about 80 feet high, with five spans across the Tyne water, but you really have to be down below the bridge to appreciate its elegance. If you look down to the right as you cross the bridge, you'll see the tiny village of Ford, 
and an interesting old house, painted rusty orange, which really stands out. This is Fort House, and it was built in about 1680. It's a two-storey and attic L-plant Laird's house. It was actually built as a country residence for the Frasers of Lovett, and takes its inspiration from French architecture. Interestingly enough, Bonnie Prince Charlie is alleged to have stayed there on his way south during the 45 Rebellion. Anyway, you only get a quick glimpse of it as you enter Pathhead. Pathhead's a small, sleepy commuter town now, but interestingly, within two miles of the town, you'll find Preston Hall, which is an 18th century country mansion, Oxenford Castle, a 16th century tower house, and Crichton Castle, a substantial 14th century castle, with connections to Mary Queen of Scots' third husband, Lord Bothwell for whom it did not end well. The town gets its name from being at the beginning of the climb as the road heads upwards towards the town of Lauder, and, as we commence the climb, that's our next main stop. The climb actually increases dramatically when we reach the line of the geological fault at the start of the Moorfoot Hills, and as you drive up, there's a spectacular view of Edinburgh and the lowlands below. On the ascent, you will see a road to the right leading to Sutra Isle on the B6368. Now, Sutra Isle is the remains of the House of the Holy Trinity, a church that was part of a complex comprising a hospital and a friary, founded in 1164. It was built on the main route from Edinburgh to the Border Abbeys, and was run by an Augustinian order of monks. It seems a strange place to have a hospital on top of a hill, but this was the main travelling route north and south, where many pilgrims would be walking, and no doubt it would have warmed the cockles of their hearts to find such a place of solace in such an inhospitable environment. There have been archaeological discoveries of rare seeds from all over the world, probably used in the production of medicine. It's believed that the hospital operated from the 12th to the 15th century with up to 300 staff. The priory itself became a burial place of the Pringle family in 1686, which is probably why some buildings have stood the test of time. Of course, the complex was built right next to Deer Street, the Roman road built in the first century to allow Roman legions advance into the north and provide logistical supplies to travel from southern Roman camps to their northern outposts. Now we follow this Roman road for most of our journey, showing that modern road builders use the same mountain passes that the Romans took advantage of nearly 2,000 years ago. And to find Deer Street, drive another half a mile from the Sutra Isle until you come to a tiny wooden sign on a post pointing into a field. Well, you have to use your imagination that this was a busy thoroughfare for Roman legions, but this it is. Well, back onto the A68, and when you eventually get to the top of the rise of the Southern Uplands Fault, at around 1,200 feet, you come to a plateau with open moorland on both sides. Of course, you won't miss a large number of wind turbines either side of the road. This is Dunlaw Wind Farm, one of many now operational in Scotland. As in most countries, wind farms are becoming a huge part of electricity generation in Scotland. If I may digress from our journey just for a moment, I found it fascinating to read that during the building of the wind farm, archaeologists discovered that the Deer Street Roman road construction was way ahead of its time. The ground around this area is boggy, and to stabilise the road, the Romans used a latticework of logs and branchwood before building the stonework above. They also discovered from pollen samples that this area was heavily wooded up until the Romans arrived, when a mass clearance of forest took place around the 1st century AD, undoubtedly to build the roads. Anyway, you are now officially in the borders, and a map will show you that it spreads from this point all the way to the English border, with some picturesque towns and villages nestled into the surrounding hills, and there's also some pretty coastal villages as well. Well, after passing through the wind farm, our drive south takes us to the town of Lauder. Its population is around 2,000 people, and many of the old milling industries have disappeared, but it's close enough to Edinburgh to commute to work. I like Lauder. It still has a medieval feel about it, with a wide main street where you can still enjoy traditional shopping in local butchers and bakeries, while behind the main thoroughfare you find narrow winding lanes, which gives the impression of an ancient town still alive today. As you enter the town, you will see an extraordinary building in the centre of the street. It's a tall, narrow, two-storey building with a clock tower and a set of steps leading up to a first-floor entry. This is the lovely old toll booth, which, in medieval times, was used to collect tolls from visitors to the town, but it also acted as the local courtroom and jail. It was originally built in the 14th century and retains its original character, but the present building dates from around the 1700s. From the toll booth, 
Look to the right and you will see a lovely old church built in 1673. Its architecture is interesting in that it's constructed on the plan of a Greek cross with a very unusual octagonal bell tower. Within the churchyard are the remains of an old watchtower built to allow a watch kept over newly dug graves to prevent grave robbers from snatching bodies in the middle of the night. And talking about the middle of the night reminds me of a visit many years ago to a girl who lived in Lauder. Actually, I'd only met the last the week before when I was working in Gallus Shields' weaving factory. I was only 16 years old, and this was my first proper job and, sort of, my first proper girlfriend. And I was smitten, so I decided to visit her. My village of Gore Bridge was 26 miles away, so I had to take a bus to see her. I perhaps stayed longer than I should have, and when her father finally made it clear that it was time for me to leave, I looked at my watch and noted that it was one in the morning. Well, with no public transport running at the time, I started walking, hoping to hitch a lift in a passing car. Well, very few cars passed and none stopped, and I recall arriving at Path Head around five in the morning. I'd walked almost 15 miles and still had eight miles to go. Well, fortunately, a farm tractor did stop and I gladly jumped onto the back of his trailer and he was able to deposit me around a mile from my home. As for the girl, well, it must not have been love as I don't recall seeing her again, outside of work anyway. It's funny, I sometimes think of that night whenever I hear the Proclaimers singing their wonderful song, I Would Walk 500 Miles. As we leave the village of Lauder, look over your left shoulder and you should just catch a glimpse of Thirlston Castle, a magnificent 16th century castle and the historic home of the Duke of Lauderdale. It was remodelled in the 1670s, then again in the 1840s, and still remains home to the Maitland family today. It's worth taking a break here and enjoying one of the guided tours, and perhaps a cream tea. Well, 11 miles further south, we come to the small town of Edelston, sitting on the River Leader. It would probably go unnoticed, but for the fact that it's famous for its association with Thomas the Rhymer. As you drive through the town, Watch out on the right-hand side for a petrol station and the Rhymer's Cafe, behind which are the ruins of an old Tower House castle. This was the home of Thomas Lermont, or True Thomas, who was reputed to have spent time with the Queen of the Fairies in the Eildon Hills, which we'll visit shortly. Thomas was said to have the power of prophecy, and some of his poems have prophesied some of the greatest events in Scottish history. The one that really stands out is as follows. On the morrow, a forenoon, shall blow the greatest wind that ever was heard before in Scotland. This prophecy actually predicted the death of King Alexander III of Scotland in 1286, who crossed the River Forth against all advice in the face of a gale. Not only did Alexander die that night with no heir, which was a catastrophe for Scotland, but it also set off a string of events that led to the devastating Scottish Wars of Independence. The prophecy of the greatest wind that was ever heard before in Scotland had come true. It's at Erlston that we leave the main road and take the B6356 on a minor road to follow in the footsteps of one of Scotland's greatest authors, Sir Walter Scott, who was associated with the borders from a very early age. Walter Scott was born on the 15th of August 1771 in an apartment on College Wynd in the old town Edinburgh. He contracted polio at the age of two and to improve his lameness he was sent out of the polluted city to the fresh airs of the Scottish borders at his paternal grandparents' farm at Sandy Now, which is not far from Smailholm Tower, which is a 15th century tower house or Peel Tower. Here he was taught to read by his aunt Jenny Scott, and learned from her tales and legends that were later reflected in his books. In later life, having made his fortune, he eventually settled in the borders, and in 1811 he bought Cartley Hold Farmhouse near Melrose. The farm's nickname was Clarty Hole, which made me smile when I first heard it, as the Scottish word clarty means dirty, and I can still hear my mother referring to other children in our street as clarty wee bairns who need a good scrub. Anyway, Scott bought the farm, and over the next five years rebuilt and expanded the site to give us the exquisite Abbotsford house that still stands as a monument to Scott today. The name Abbotsford comes from a local ford in the river used by the monks or abbots of Melrose Abbey. I'll talk more about Abbotsford shortly, but as we climb up this narrow road, you do get a glimpse of a tall tower house on the horizon, and this is Smailholm Tower, where young Scott spent much of his childhood. Eventually we arrive at a place called Scott's View, and what a panoramic view it is, with the three peaked Eildon Hills standing proudly over the lush green borders countryside, with rolling fields and farmland and grazing sheep stretching into the distance. 
and just below is the winding River Tweed, and you can see why Sir Walter Scott left home every morning to come up here for some solace, and probably some inspiration. It's said that when Scott died, his cortege made this journey up the hill to visit the place that he loved to come. Apparently, the horse drawing the funeral cortege stopped when it reached Scott's view, having been so used to stopping there in the past. Well, as we continue down this B road, you'll pass a wood, and look out for a signpost to the William Wallace statue, which, you might ask, seems a rather strange place to find a statue of one of Scotland's greatest warriors. Well, there's a small car park, and you then go through a gate into the wood, and it takes about five to ten minutes to walk to a lovely viewpoint, and suddenly there it is, in all its glory, the William Wallace statue. It was commissioned by David Stuart Erskine, 11th Earl of Buchan. It's made of red sandstone, sculpted by John Smith in 1814, and depicts Wallace looking over the River Tweed. At 31 feet high, or nearly 10 metres, it's huge, and surprisingly it was one of the first statues of Wallace in Scotland. Well, I took my grandchildren to see it this week, and you can get an idea of its size if you look at one of the photos that I've posted on my website, showing the children standing alongside it. The statue stands in the grounds of Bemerside Estate, and as you drive on you'll come to the entry to Bemerside House, a 16th century tower house or Peel Tower. And as you look at the house, which has been extended over the years, in the centre you can still see the original tower. It's the home to the Hague family, and was bought by the British government in 1921 and presented to Field Marshal, the first Earl of Hague, the British overall commander in World War I. Now, there does remain some controversy over General Haig's reputation due to the vast numbers of soldiers who were killed during that conflict. Some say that he fought a 20th century battle using 19th century tactics, especially when it came to trench warfare and pushing the troops out of the trenches with rifles and bayonets into a torrent of machine gun fire with little chance of survival. However, we won, so enough said. This house remains the seat of the chief of Clan Haig, and the family motto is interesting in that it is Tide What May, and that refers to a 13th century poem by Thomas the Rhymer, who I've just mentioned in Earlston, who predicted that there would always be a Hague at Bemerside, and here's a quote. Tide what may be tied, Hague shall be Hague of Bemerside. In other words, Hagues will never leave Bemerside. Well, as we drop down this road, we come to a T-junction where we would normally turn left to go back onto the A68, but there's a signpost to the right showing Driver Abbey, and this is one sight you cannot miss. Half a mile later, and we arrive initially at the Dryborough Arms Hotel, and then just beyond the entrance to the ruins of Dryborough Abbey. There are three other border abbeys in close proximity to Dryborough, Jedborough, Kelso and Melrose, and it was King David I of Scotland, the son of St Margaret, who was one of medieval Scotland's greatest monastic patrons. Now, you may remember from previous podcasts in Edinburgh that I mentioned him for founding Holyrood Abbey. Well, his first was in 1113, when he founded Selkirk Abbey from the Tyrannensians. Indeed, he founded more than a dozen monasteries during his reign, patronising various new monastic orders. These monasteries not only reflected King David's Christian beliefs, but were also very functional, becoming centres of foreign influence, with literate men serving the Crown's administrative needs, as well as providing a flow of revenue into the Crown's coffers. For example, the Cistercian monastic order of Melrose Abbey introduced new agricultural practices, transforming southern Scotland into one of northern Europe's most important sources of sheep wool. Turning to Dryborough Abbey itself, it's situated in an idyllic spot where the River Tweed meanders around the abbey in a horseshoe shape. It was founded in 1150 by Hugh de Morville, an Anglo-Norman who had befriended King David some years before. And there's a lovely obelisk just to the south of the abbey, erected by the 11th Earl of Buchan to commemorate its foundation, with a sculpture of Hugh de Morville in set. Now, the 11th Earl of Buchan is the same man who commissioned the William Wallace statue, and he was the founder of the Society of Antiquities in Scotland in 1780, thus his wish to preserve the legacy of Scotland's history. The monastic order of Dryborough was premenstruatensions, and I won't tell you how many times I said that before I recorded this correctly. They were monks from the house of Primontre in northern France. Theirs was not a silent order, and they had to preach and teach to those outside the abbey walls. I have to say I've visited a number of times, and I always get a feeling of great peace and tranquillity when you visit here. And you'll also find within the ruins of the abbey church the grave of Sir Walter Scott, whose family had a plot within the abbey, which is quite appropriate, noting how close it is to Scott's view. 
Also buried there is Field Marshal Haig of Bemerside. When we leave the Abbey to get back onto the A68, there's a turning up the A699 to Kelso, where the ruins of another of the great border abbeys can be found. There's little left of the Abbey, but it's a reminder of the town's important past. That Abbey was founded in the 12th century by a community of Tyronsian monks. The monks came from Tyrone Abbey, not far from the Mother Abbey, located near Chartres in France. It has a wonderful location overlooking the point where the rivers Tweed and Teviot join. The abbey is also in sight of Roxburgh Castle, a fabulous stronghold of medieval Scotland, but today only a few ruined walls remain. Both Kelso Abbey and Roxburgh Castle were founded by King David I, and the town and castle developed into the royal borough of Roxburgh. The castle has a fascinating history where it changed hands between the Scots and the English from the 12th to the 15th centuries. It was at Roxburgh Castle in 1306 that King Edward I of England imprisoned Mary Bruce, the sister of King Robert the Bruce, and kept her in a cage hung outside the castle for four years, probably in the hope that the Bruce would be tempted to secure her release. Other female relatives of the Bruce were also taken hostage, including his wife Elizabeth de Burr, who remained imprisoned by the English until 1314, when she was returned to Scotland in a prisoner exchange after the Battle of Bannockburn. As I mentioned, the castle changed hands over the years and it was in the hands of the English in 1460 when King James II of Scotland besieged the castle in an attempt to take it back. During the siege, metal fragments from the explosion of one of his bombards struck the king and he died from his wounds. However, the siege did succeed and after its capture, King James' wife and queen, Mary of Gelders, ordered the castle to be demolished. Today, the ruins stand in the grounds of Floor's Castle, the seat of the Duke of Roxburgh. And when you drive to Kelso, you'll see the magnificent Floors Castle standing out in the countryside within sight of Roxburgh Castle itself. In fact, it's difficult to see the ruins of Roxburgh Castle from the road, so you'll probably have to find it on Google Maps to get there. And turning to Floors Castle, it's actually an 18th century mansion house built by the Scottish architect William Adam for the Duke of Roxburgh in 1720 and was remodelled by the fashionable architect William Henry Playfair in 1837. It has a fabulous central block with two symmetrical service wings. Its beauty is enhanced by the fact that it stands by the bank of the River Tweed and overlooks the Cheviot Hills to the south, and has a view of the ruins of Roxburgh Castle. And now having looked at Kelso, with surrounding landmarks, we return to Dryborough, and we drop down onto the A68 at St Boswell's. We'll have just crossed the River Tweed, which flows east across the border region and Tweed Cloth takes its name from its association with the river. The bridge that you cross has a low parapet, so you get a good view of both sides. On the right-hand side, you might see some old buildings, which would have been the Tweed weaving mills from the 19th century. St Boswell's is a quaint village with around 1,500 inhabitants, and it takes its name from St Bosil, who was a 7th century monk from Melrose Abbey. There's a gypsy fair held here every year in July, and it might be fun to have your horoscope read if you come to visit. The village is also on the route of St Cuthbert's Way, a 60-mile long-distance footpath which links Melrose Abbey to the holy island of Lindisfarne, sitting off the east coast. St Cuthbert was a 7th century saint who came from the borders and associated with Melrose Abbey, and will be visiting Melrose Abbey in part two of the Borders podcast. Well, at St Boswell's, we now turn left onto the A68 once more and make our way to the south. A few miles later, and just before arriving in Jedburgh, there's a turning to the right to the village of Ancrum. You would drive past without noticing under normal circumstances, but I believe that it's worth mentioning the Battle of Ancrum, which took place here in 1545. It was part of a wider conflict created by Henry VIII of England, who wanted his son and heir, Edward, to marry Mary Queen of Scots, who was only three years old at the time. The Scottish nobles initially agreed, but then reneged on the deal and renewed its alliance with France. Henry VIII's fury was such that he declared war on Scotland and his army duly devastated much of southern Scotland and Edinburgh was burned. The war was called the rough wooing. You know, to woo a lady is to ask them out, wine and dine them, perhaps win their hand. Well, when Henry's son was rejected by Mary's guardians, Henry took rather drastic action to make his point. The Battle of Ancrum Moor was just part of that rough wooing, but on this occasion the Scots won the battle which temporarily at least ended English incursions into the borders. The English army was led by Sir Ralph Ewer, whose continuous pillaging of the border towns came to the attention of Scottish nobles, 
especially with the atrocious burning of Broomhouse Tower near Hoyock, with the lady of the house, her children and servants in sight. The Scottish Earls of Arran, Angus and Rothes raised an army and waited for Sir Ralph Ure in Ancrum. The English consisted of around 3,000 German and Spanish mercenaries, with 1,500 English borderers and 700 Scottish borderers. Around 5,000 men against a Scottish army consisting of around two to 3,000 Scots and French mercenaries. I won't go into detail of the battle, but effectively the English were outmaneuvered and suffered a heavy defeat. Now, if you do visit the battlefield, you may come across a monument near the site of the battle called Lilliard's Edge. Now, Lilliard was a lady who fought at the battle because her lover had been killed during the other English border raids. It's said that she fought ferociously, to such an extent that when her legs were cut off, she continued to fight to her last breath. And there's an inscription on the monument in the Scottish dialect which reflects that glory. I'll read it, and to help you understand better, the word stain in Scots is stone. The word muckle is large or huge. So here it is. Fair maiden Lilliard lies under this stain. Little was her stature, but muckle was her fame. Upon the English loons she laid money thumps, and when her legs were cut it off, she fought upon her stumps. Well, it's quite an image of an enraged woman avenging the death of her poor lover. The monument itself was erected here in the 19th century, replacing an earlier stone with the same inscription and believed to date from around 1743. How true is the tale from 200 years earlier is anyone's guess, but I do love the story. And returning to the A68 heading south, you will soon arrive into the town of Jedburgh, with this extraordinary ruined abbey up on the mound overlooking the town, with the Jed River running at its foot. And this, my dear friends, is where this first part of the Borders podcast ends. Well, I hope you enjoyed that small whirlwind tour, and I've really only touched upon some of the more prominent landmarks on the tour. I was actually in the Borders last week with my grandchildren, and they particularly enjoyed seeing the huge statue of William Wallace and I put a photo of them standing next to it on my website, and that gives you a scale of the size of the monument. There are many other photos on the trip, so have a look at my Facebook page and my website. And of course, to ensure you get notification of all my unique Scotland podcasts, please go to my website, Exclusive Scottish Visits, and click on the email subscribe button to register. Or you may be listening to Unique Scotland on one of the many podcast channels, such as Apple, Spotify, or even YouTube. In any case, don't forget to subscribe to ensure you receive notification of my next issue. And thank you all for your messages and kind comments on a number of channels. I have a shout out for a couple of email connections, the first of which is from Livia, Caroline and Abigail from the USA, who wrote, Hello John, we've recently enjoyed a self-guided tour around Scotland, travelling through the Highlands and Islands, and finish our time at the southern coast near Wigton. We greatly enjoyed your unique Scotland podcast and learned much about Scottish history from your work. And they also made it to Clavacairns and Culloden Battlefield with the Outlander connections. And well done to all of you for visiting Wigton, a lovely part of Scotland. My second shout out goes to Jill Bossiet and family of Sylvie, Tim and Arne from Desselgem, Belgium. They wrote that they had just returned from an amazing nine days in Scotland. And they wrote... Your podcast was very helpful in preparing our trip and spicing up our visits with great side stories, such as Saucy Mary on the Isle of Skye, which is just one of them. Well, thank you both, and I'm delighted to hear so many people self-guide using my podcast. But don't forget, I also do a bespoke itinerary service as well. So if that's something that interests you, then please do get in touch. You will see and do things that you never thought of and visit those wee hidden gems that I personally love to visit as well. Before I finish by telling you what's coming in the next podcast, I've been asked by a number of listeners how they can contribute to my work for all the research and also the pleasure they receive in listening to my podcast. Well, I've just started a Buy Me A Coffee account, which allows you to make a small donation to keep the Unique Scotland podcast coming. The link's on my website, but it's easy peasy to action in that you search for buymeacoffee.com forward slash Unique Scotland. And that will take you to a page which allows you to, well, buy me a coffee. So thank you in advance to all of those who would wish to contribute to the buymeacoffee.com forward slash Unique Scotland. Well, that brings to an end this tour of the Scottish Borders part one. And I've loved sharing this region with you. Our next adventure in part two of the Scottish Borders is to see the fabulous Jedburgh Abbey 
and there is a connecting story of Jedburgh with Mary Queen of Scots. We'll also visit Melrose Abbey and then visit the home of Sir Walter Scott at Abbotsford. I will also tell you all about the border clans and the reavers who were cattle and sheep rustlers who showed no mercy to their enemies. On our return to Edinburgh, as we leave the borders, we will pass through Gallish Hills and I'll tell you about my first real job at the age of 16 and how I contributed to the borders weaving industry. Well, as always, I have thoroughly enjoyed bringing a part of Scotland to you. I always welcome feedback, so if you wish to comment on any of the areas we have visited today, or if you wish me to cover any aspect of Scottish life, then get in touch through the contact page on my website, or send an email to info at exclusivescottishvisits.co.uk. I get a great deal of pleasure bringing you these podcasts, and I'm delighted to have met many of you who have listened to them. Keep your messages of support coming, and don't forget... If you do intend visiting Scotland without a formal guide, then perhaps one of my bespoke itineraries may help you plan a more spectacular holiday. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you all listening today, and I would now like to sign off in traditional Scottish fashion by raising my glass with a wee dram to you, wherever you are in the world. Slanjava. listening to the Unique Scotland podcast with exclusive scottishvisits.co.uk. To receive all our episodes automatically, please subscribe now.